practice in this hour, showing of yourself as not having been shown for 2,000 years, Lord, except little glimpses here and there, little parts, but now at the end time, drawing into full manifestation, for which we're very grateful. We pray that we may come to such a place, Lord, that our sincerity and reverence will be as it ought to be and should be, Lord. Yet how can it be unless, Lord, you reveal to us and give us strength in the inner man something somehow, Lord, that will be able to apprehend that for which we are apprehended, O God, in this particular hour, and then show forth somehow, Lord, in our lives, our demeanor, our spirit of worship, our gathering together, Lord, the study of your word, that we really do believe in our believers, O God. Sanctify us, we pray by thy word, for thy word is truth. We'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> now, we're still in this message of Brother Branham's, who is this Melchizedek? And from the title of this message, it is hardly possible that one would have any idea that Brother Branham would teach upon the true identity and destiny of the sons of God and would answer such questions as, who are we? Where do we come from? What are we doing here and why are we doing thusly? Where are we going and what will it be like when we get there? And then, what is our ultimate end, the ultimate destination, what, and what is it like? And uh, this message then deals with us and with Jesus Christ from eternity to eternity. That is what we're looking at, and to simply announce this subject title, who is this Melchizedek, would never have led us to believe that actually Christ and ourselves if so be we are true sons of God, would be identified in this particular message from eternity to eternity to show us exactly how that we come, except for a minor deflection, just like Jesus Christ. Now, of course, <clears throat> we know very well that this is something that will be fought by our minds because of our circumstances and because of our inward natures being such as to, number one, disbelieve God, and number two, the disbelief is fortified by the very actions that we allow ourselves or perhaps disallow ourselves but still go through in the light of what the Scripture says we should not be going through, but rather another channel going through for the glory of God. In other words, in plain English, what we experience in lives and the experiences we go through because of the very nature of man to be more sinful than righteous, even actually when a person calls himself born again, we are a little bit, uh, not a little bit, but greatly prone to turn aside from believing that we had our beginnings in God. <clears throat> because <clears throat> to look at the beginnings in God and to really believe our beginnings were there, uh, we look at life as it is and we say, well, I just don't know that that is possible. But Brother Branham does answer the question of who we are, where did we come from, where are we go what are we doing here, why are we doing it, where are we going to go soon as we die? What happens after that? What are those conditions like? And uh, he deals with us, as I said, just same as he deals with Jesus Christ from eternity to eternity. Now, to begin, let us consider question number one, and we answer the we look at it in the singular: Who am I? <clears throat> who am I, or who are we? But it's who am I because we both all have to answer that particular question. So, is who is this person? who speaks of my life, my body, my destiny, the person who is a possessor or an owner. David said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And my soul, why art thou disquieted within me? 
Speaking again, my soul, hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him. Now notice, he's possessor of a soul. And he's instructing his soul. That's Psalm 42, 11. Jesus said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Matthew 26. Also in John 12, 27, he said, now is my soul troubled. Remember Mary who said, my soul or my soul does magnify the Lord and my spirit, my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Luke 1, 46 said, and Paul prayed for the Thessalonians in 523 that the very God of peace sanctify you, holy, and your whole soul, spirit, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, there is no doubt that you and I, spoken of in Scripture, is a triunity a composite of three parts that make up the entire person. And uh, there is literally, physically, no functioning of one apart from the other. They are all of necessity here at one time, body, soul, and spirit. Though if it is time for the body to decease, the spirit will go first, the soul will linger, it will leave, and the body, of course, will grow cold and dead, put in the ground where it will <clears throat> decay, go back to gases, ashes, or whatsoever. So, looking at this fact then, that we are a triunity, we are a composite of three parts, yet we cannot help but know from Scripture that you and I can escape from this body and still be a living, reasoning entity as Paul said in Philippians 1, 21 to 24, <clears throat> we could use many scripture on this, but I just want to use this one. Paul speaking to the Philippians and concerning himself. 21 to 24, and he says, For to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Well, uh, there must be then something beyond the life in this body somewhere, someplace. Because what profit would it be to simply leave the only thing you got going for you that might not be going for you too well? Because actually, nobody wants to die, even in the case of suicide, the person doesn't really want to die, he just wants to get out of the mess he's in, hoping there's something much better than what he's into. That's, I mean, that's certainly the way it goes. But he says here, 22, but if I live in the flesh, now notice he's placing it. If I'm living in the flesh, now then he must be a place other than the flesh to live in. Or he wouldn't have said that. Now if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I know not. <clears throat> so this man is above and beyond the flesh. Watch, for I am in a strait betwixt two. I want to get out of here to be with Christ. But I think maybe it's a good thing if I stay here and be with you. Now, he said, if I get out of here, or I don't get out of here. Now, if he gets out of here, he leaves his body here. If he doesn't get out of here, he's got to stay with his body because it doesn't do any good unless he's in a body you couldn't communicate. Nevertheless, to abide with in the flesh is far more needful for you. So you notice he says here, <clears throat> I am literally apart from my flesh when it comes to this existence of I, me, myself. Now remember Jesus said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And again, remember he died physically and also it is told in Ecclesiastes, <clears throat> the spirit goes back to God who gave it and Brother Branham tells us that spirit is given to us at the moment the baby drops from the mother's womb and life enters into that child by reason of the spirit. <clears throat> so you have the tripartite being and one cannot function without the other when it comes to this life here in the flesh. But you'll notice that though the body 
cannot function without the other two, it is certainly true that the other two can function without the body. <clears throat> See, now the point is what we're looking at, if we're looking at something over here, we're looking at the fact that Jesus said, into thy hands I commend my spirit, and also the scripture that says, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. <clears throat> Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So you got Jesus going three different ways. And he speaks of all three in the terminology of I and mine. You understand what we're saying? Perhaps you don't, it's all right. We're going to look at it anyway. Because that's, that's exactly how we use our own language. We follow the biblical language. And remember, you have to follow a language of philosophy because science cannot do one thing for you. Science doesn't have a clue. And the minute you try to relate theology or true understanding of the word to anything in nature, <clears throat> you're going to run into problems. You can't do it. The scripture is our authority. So into thy hands I commend my spirit. Thou will not leave my soul in hell. Two different places, as far as the east is from the west, or as high as the heavens above the earth, the spirit went back to God who gave it. The soul went into Hades. The body went into the tomb. Now, it also says that Jesus went to preach to the souls in prison, <clears throat> which is evidently hell, upper and lower Sheol. Now, we can go there to 1 Peter, uh, the third chapter. And we come up with verses 18 to 20. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now you notice, now that's not his own spirit because his spirit went back to God. He's going to be quickened by God, and he's going to come out of Hades. His body quickened, come into light. By which also, notice, by which also in the realm of the spiritual, not his body, but in the realm of the spirit. Now, that's not the spirit. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. That's the soul part. And remember, man is two-thirds spirit as against one-third material. See? And then, of course, when you get the baptism with the Holy Ghost, you've got four parts. And so, therefore, it is easy for us, if we only believe, to bring the flesh under subjection. See, now, by that, by, in the spirit, that's the soul, he went down to preach under the spirits in prison. <clears throat> now, what spirits are they? Again, the thought is souls. He's talking about the spiritual part. Because the spirit goes back to God who gave it. The spirit is of God. It's a, I beg your pardon. The spirit is allowed of God, being given by God, but it is not of God. Now, there's got to be something then that is of God. And we'll be we're looking at it, but don't worry about it. We'll get to it. Now, all right, now, this, he went down in, 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 in the part of, the, of, this, of, his triun, of his triunity to meet with those in a part of their triunity, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God <clears throat> waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water, the like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of flesh, but the answer of a con good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, who is not down there anymore, but he's gone into heaven? <clears throat> now, the thing is, in what shape did he go into heaven? He went into heaven fully united in body, soul, and spirit. And he's there now, not on the mercy seat behind the throne, but since the seals are open, because he opened the seals, the one on the throne came down here in Revelation 10 and 1, and he is on the throne fulfilling perfectly the Melchizedek priesthood. Serving man as he's never served God previously, as, he, as he's never served man previously or served God. <clears throat> That's Jesus doing that. Now, and all is subject unto him. Now, also, we might note 
what Jesus said in Matthew, the 10th chapter, <clears throat> 28. And he said, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And that's when hell gets moved up upon the earth, we notice the lake of fire. <clears throat> They'll be destroyed in there. Remember, God alone has power over the soul. He said, all souls are mine. So we're looking at this picture here. Now, from this scripture, it is very evident that I, the real person, the true entity, can be narrowed down to the soul. Because into thy hands I commend my spirit. <clears throat> so my is somewhere and spirit is gone. Into the ground, my body was placed. There is only one portion left, and that's the soul. So my soul, you will not leave there. So <clears throat> my and soul are related, no matter how you look at it. So narrow it down to the soul. So that within the soul, and inseparable from the soul is a source force. S-O-U-R-C-E hyphen F-O-R-C-E hyphen a life. That without it, there would be no body, B-O-D-Y, and therefore no necessity for a spirit. You follow? <clears throat> well, it couldn't be a body, it couldn't be a spirit if it weren't for the soul. And yet, spoken of in the soul, he says, my soul. So there will be a life force, a source force. You notice how, <clears throat> I didn't see the show that one, what is it called, E.T. or something? You know, what do you call it? You know, the extraterrestrial individual. They say it's pretty, pretty cute. <clears throat> and in there they use the word, the force be with you. See, you can't get away from reality of source force. You can't do it. Now, source force is identical with God. Now, will source force or life concerning us be identical with God? That is the question we're looking at. And the answer, of course, is only in some instances. See, now, <clears throat> so of necessity, there is no necessity for a spirit or a body without the soul. And this is correct as seen in Scripture, for as the Scripture says, the soul that sinneth, it shall not. So, whatever is contained in the soul is, in a sense of the word, viable, and yet not really viable. It is what you might say, there is an alternate, an alternative. There is that which cannot stand up to eternal existence and there is that which can stand up to eternal existence because evidently one can die, then the altar or the alternative distinction is one will not die. For the soul that sinneth, it shall die. <clears throat> the point is what would cause it to sin. Or does it mean death? Also notice in Matthew 16, <clears throat> 28, no. Well, well, that's not the one I wanted. Uh, I'm ahead of myself there, but don't worry about it because what I'm thinking of is here, and I just put a missed passage down here. 
What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You're getting into Luke really, what it is. <clears throat> what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Now you're talking in the strictly material. Here is a man who is living in a body. He has a soul. He has a spirit. And all he's thinking of is material possession. And sometime or other, he gets, if it possible, to gain the whole world. Now, what is it profitable to him if in the process? Now, notice it doesn't say soul and spirit. That wouldn't be bad if he lost it. See, that's not so bad. Because that's not what we're looking at. It's the soul. See? So, therefore, whatever lies within the soul or beyond the soul, <clears throat> that particular thing could not exist, could not be without a soul. Now, I know you're looking at the fact or the thought. Is it possible the soul and the life is one and the same thing? <clears throat> not necessarily. However, what is the origin of that life in the soul? Because we're going to stick to that understanding of somebody that's wrapped up in a triunity. And he comprises a triunity. And the soul and the life are absolutely inseparable. Now, what kind of a life is it? <clears throat> we go to Ephesians, the first chapter, and we can see that life absolutely. And it has to do with lives, L-I-V-E-S. Just as it said, God breathed into Adam the breath of lives. Not the breath of life. He breathed into Adam the breath of lives, and that was into the body. Adam, per se, was already living in the form of a spirit form. And we'll look at it in a little while. <clears throat> Ephesians 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the placing of children by Jesus Christ to himself, <clears throat> according to the good pleasure of his will. The genesis of these people, the beginnings, is in God himself, and therefore somehow is a part of the life of God. In Galatians, the fourth chapter, the sixth verse, and because you are sons, not will be sons, are not made sons, something happens so that you will be a son. And this talks to every single person in the world and say, well, what if I'm not a son of God? You'll never be born again. That's all. <clears throat> Some people never hear the gospel. It goes right by their noses. Like a good, a very lovely, dear man, he said, I have never seen a miracle. He said, I don't know what a miracle be. I've never seen it. Yet his own wife, watching the television set under Oral Roberts, was healed of tuberculosis. But he's never seen the vision. The man's crazy. Have you ever seen a chrysanthemum? I'm looking at it, but I've never seen a chrysanthemum. You say, Brother Bale, how stupid can you get? Just that stupid. Just that blind. You think there aren't people like that? You've got to be kidding. They'll never see because they never were meant. They're not a part of it. How can a blind man see? <clears throat> well, you say the blind man can go by touch. That's true. What are spiritually blind people going by? Another feeling. But they're not feeling for God. Now, remember, there's a feeling for God, and they'll never have it. Now, I, I, it's a hard, thing, hard to say, but I'm not going to bypass it. Now, it says here, because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. In other words, the baptism with the Holy Ghost <clears throat> to give you a complete renewal, to bring you back to Jesus Christ, to anoint you, that you might do the works of God in the limited sense that you are allowed by his predestinating power. Over here in, in, in Hebrews, we love Hebrews, the second chapter. 
And in there it says, verse 9, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels, who became a little lower than the angels, suffering a death, crowned with honor and glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every son. That word man should be in italics. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one source. <clears throat> Can anybody outside of being conceived by the begetting of the male ever claim to be a true brother unless that one begot him also? Can do it. You can be a half brother. <clears throat> you can be adopted. But there ain't no way, no way, there's no way at all to have been begotten by that person unless a genuine begetting took place by the person himself. Neither can anybody absolutely be a child of God unless that person has been begotten by the same source that Jesus the Christ was begotten. Now that puts the emphasis what we're dealing on today and what I know many people don't like because they want the haphazard attitude of saying, well, we're all sinners, hallelujah. We're all reprobate, we're all dogs, we're all goats. But somehow God, by divine alchemy, if we will just listen to him, that's all that it takes, we will turn from a dog and a pig and a sow and you name it, into a sheep. Hogwash. You will get a monstrous hybrid, and we're getting them now the same as science is splitting genes in the laboratory and bringing them together. And pretty soon, science will cultivate, I suppose. They'll take a plant pretty soon. They'll take something out of the genes of a, of a thistle and put it with the genes of a dog, and you'll have a dog with prickles on it. He won't only bite if he jumps on you. He had better watch dog. He will scar you to death. They'll do something like that. You see, you don't believe it. Just wait and see. Jesus said in John 17, 16, they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. You say, well, that refers to their characteristic behavior. Hogwash. <laughs> Such nonsense. Those guys were a million miles away from behavior of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And they didn't have two cents worth of real understanding most of the time. He is talking of the source. He is talking of the source, absolutely. <clears throat> I believe when Jesus said, they are not of the world even as I am not of the world, he was referring directly to the first chapter of John, 12 and 13, but as many as received him, to them gave he the authority to become the sons of God, even to them believe in his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And they weren't born again at that time. <clears throat> they were born by the will of God, which says, chosen in him. And he placed, first of all, every son in every position that he wanted him. And there wasn't one that would, would be lost and not raised up. But there was another seed the Heavenly Father hadn't, had not planted, which would have to be a hybrid, which is exactly what Cain was because he was the seed of the serpent. Because the serpent was a tall, handsome, giant, structured individual, very dark-featured. Adam was, whether you want to believe it or not, was a chestnut brown. The very word Adam means clay, able to blush. How many people can blush today? Not many real human beings left. There never have been any real human beings since Noah. <clears throat> Outside of Jesus Christ, he wasn't a real human being either because the egg and the sperm was created by God, just nourished by Mary. Where'd all the brunettes come from? I'm <laughs> saying there's serpents eating anything like that. I'm just saying in the original, you go back at it, means of the, of the earth, clay, and able to blush. <clears throat> How many people can blush today? <clears throat> uh, 
Well, the serpent couldn't blush. He was too black for that. He wasn't a black man like we know black people. He says, not nothing to do with it. It's way back there, yarn, way back in that day. Serpent seed, you know, there's a, there's a hybridization. Satan has no way to, to, to cause to conceive seed, so he had to take an animal. <clears throat> All right. So we see, as far as we can understand, who were born not of blood nor the will of the flesh. Now, the will of the flesh absolutely is sexual intercourse, which brings about the birth of children because people want it. They can't refrain from it. That's why they're going to die from AIDS. See? Nor of the will of man means planned birth. See? In other words, not man as a source, original source, but God as original source. And every one of those children were ordained to come by natural election right down today, and we'll talk about that later. <clears throat> so we ponder, who are we? Where did we come from? Why are we here? And we have the answers in this message, who is this Melchizedek that Brother Branham preached and gave to us. And this brings us exactly to where we are in Melchizedek, page 17. For already we have studied what happens to us when we die. We become separated from our spirit and our body, and our soul, which contains the gene of God, goes back, goes to a place <clears throat> where it receives a form which it should have received to begin with, bypassed it, will pick it up. And that'll be a wonderful thing. Now, they can't eat and they can't drink, but they don't need to. They'll be there just exactly as God foreordained it. Then, of course, in the resurrection, just the same as Jesus, who spoke to the souls in prison in their particular bodies, and he in his particular spirit body, came back and picked up his own body, now completely changed and glorified. So did the others who came up with him, David and Abraham, <clears throat> Joshua, all the others, the great Old Testament saints of God, picked up their bodies, and they're in a glorified form. And during the second part of the first resurrection, everyone in the bride will come out in that form, spirit body, word body, call it what you want, pick up his glorified body, take it away in a rapture. The remaining people here will catch their glorified, that is their, their, their body of glory, which is the spirit body, <clears throat> in midair on the way to the wedding supper. Now, that's how it goes. That may sound like strange theology, but there it is. That's what we understand. So, we're looking at what has happened here to us and what is happening. <clears throat> and Brother Branham has mentioned on page 17 in paragraph 79, that we have come here not in a word body, not in that spirit form that cannot be tempted by sin, <clears throat> because look, you're not eating or drinking or doing anything else in that body. So how in the world are you going to be tempted? Anything that could tempt you, which cannot tempt you, but if it was there, to tempt <clears throat> would be so below the concepts of that person in that body, it wouldn't be a temptation. There is no temptation for me to eat beans under most consideration or especially frog legs. I would like to do it in order to say that I like it. <clears throat> and I enjoy it. And I know frog legs sautéed in butter and garlic do taste good. But the thought of those things jerking in a frying pan is more than I can take. So you see, you cannot tempt me with frog legs. How could you tempt then a person in a body that is above temptation? That's the millennium. You could turn every devil in hell loose and every temptation under high heaven. It wouldn't phase you any more than a rock suddenly feels it ought to get up and run because there's a bigger rock going to fall on it. It doesn't matter him. The rock falls and crushes him. He's got nothing. You see, in other words, what I'm saying to you there. <clears throat> but we have been sent here to be tempted in the flesh. 
And you'll notice that Brother Branham makes a very pertinent statement, which I feel is 100% scriptural. <clears throat> and that is that Jesus withstood everything thrown against him by the devil because he had a memory of what things were previously when he was in that theophonic form or that spirit form or that word form. <clears throat> See? He remembered. Now, we know that memory goes with us from here to the other side. We know that. Now, that memory is retained in that form to which we go. But you will notice in the resurrection, <clears throat> there comes a time when God wipes every tear from every eye and there is no more memory of anything here. So therefore, Jesus, having known all things, from the previous incarnation in a complete dominant adult figure <coughs> could not sin. And if we had been in the theophony form, we would not sin either because we'd simply know what was there and say, hey, and be so discriminating <coughs> as to make the proper choice. Now listen, as much as I don't like beans, I am prone to enjoy beans on the ground that I know they're good for me. That's not exactly a lie. <laughs> I'm trying to get a point across. It's the truth. I'm just not a dry bean lover. But I could be sold a bill of goods to like beans and rice, especially brown rice, because it's a perfect protein. And I could eat them quicker if I was allowed a good tomato sauce, but nightshade plants are very tough on my arthritis. <clears throat> well, anyway, that covers the point. What we're looking at here, see now? <clears throat> now, Jesus knew from previous... And in the comparison of what was, just didn't want it. <clears throat> See, what he was in tune with by reason of not having deviated from the original path that God set out, but designated only to the one son, the only begotten son, such as this, and never would be again, <clears throat> he could not, even though in human form, find himself compatible with anything that existed because he was in a superhuman form. And then, of course, when he was glorified, forget it. There's no, no, no attachment. <clears throat> so now, if we, therefore, were it possible, it wasn't possible because God must work out according to his own Godhood. We had to bypass that form, be put in a form of flesh, and we're gonna talk about it. I've got different notes written down here. <clears throat> we're gonna talk about it and look at it. We had to come by way of flesh, and consequently, Adam sinned, Eve sinned, everybody sinned. We can't blame, blame Adam for our problems because we sin on our own, <clears throat> absolutely. And the reason we sin is because we cannot discriminate because we are not on the level to discriminate so that we could stand right here and say sin has no power over me, period. It may tempt me, it may try me, but forget it. <clears throat> we weren't in that form. How in the world, if you are in that form, could you even know what sin was? <clears throat> How could you possibly even analyze it? How could you draw judgment on it? Because all things are pure to the pure in heart. Couldn't be evil anywhere. Mm -mm. No, sir, now let's get down to the nitty gritty. There is no such thing as evil anyway. It is what you do with the good. 
If you go God's way, you'll never have evil. <clears throat> if you go man's way, you're going to have Anyway, that's, we won't go into that because that's a lot of thinking that we don't want to get into this very minute. That's all right to touch it. Now, Brother Branham said that's the reason Jesus knew all things because he was word before he was flesh. That's true. And you and I, our names are put on the Lamb's Book of Life, but we never became a word body because the word was not spoken to that end. The word spoken to the end we came to, let us make man in our image. That was the word spoken. <clears throat> So we bypassed the theophonic form. He bypassed it. Now we're down here in the flesh. Now, Brother Branham talking about us before the foundation. We skipped the body. Jesus before the foundation. He did not skip the body. The greater son of David, the great son of God, did not skip it. We know that. But we did skip it. Now listen. Later, he says, we become the word. Later on down the road. <clears throat> Can't get it until you... Time has come to get it. Now, he said, here, here. Now, when you use the word here, we are talking in contradistinction to there. We were there, but we're not in a position to receive a receptacle whereby memory could function. Uh -uh. We missed the receptacle. <clears throat> down here and in there there is a receptacle in that eternal form there is a receptacle because Jesus had it <clears throat> we left that receptacle to gain this receptacle the mind that's where memory is and that comes by spirit and spirit inundates the body to get the body moving out here in this realm. And therefore, spirit and mind, though not synonymous, work together. And our knowledge and our information is completely erroneous because all we can do is judge by what goes on out here. Then the spirit of God cuts in at the rebirth. And believe me, he's got a job and a half. And unless we crucify to ourselves our own self, not the son of God now, but crucify ourselves to ourselves, <clears throat> which is the greatest battle ever fought, which is the battle of Armageddon, to put the word ahead of all the senses until the senses are completely overcome by the word of God. Then the flow reverses so we are no longer pouring out from what we gain around here, but we're pouring out the word which is enlivened by the Holy Ghost. Then we come parallel to the form that we missed. <clears throat> but it's still not the same. It's not the form. But you come to where now, though having missed it, you and I are living in a place of victory, but this memory is there in contradistinction to what should have been there. That memory is gone. And then, thank God, the end is re it's reversed. Okay, listen. Here we are formed, Brother Branham said, to the word image, to be a partaker of the word, feed on the word by being predestined since the beginning. <clears throat> now, the question comes up. If God did this to us, which we don't think is very fair, <clears throat> that he would allow us to bypass that body and put us <clears throat> in the soul or a gene of God, down here now, without that memory, which is evidently so valuable and wonderful. <clears throat> so knowing nothing of it, we're in this particular condition. Now watch what he says. In spite of our own analysis and in spite of our own conclusions, what form God placed us in was predestinated <clears throat> to this extent that though we are in this form, we can partake of the word of God and thereby be transformed to the image of Christ. Now that's a big order, but that's exactly what God's word tells us. And that's the Bible. Brother Branham hit it right on the head. He said, look, later on we're going to become this word. We'll pick it up. <clears throat> but he said, here's the word we're into now. We are formed to the word image to be partakers of the word. 
If you were born of God, if your gene was in God to begin with, though you're in this human body, which is a real mess, because there's no true human beings anymore. Remember the sons of light, according to Malik and, and Wilkinson. <clears throat> the true sons of light were the children of God. They were meek and sweet and mild-tempered. They were not warlike. And they believed in a kind and loving God who took care of them. But you see, having been having already mingled the seed with the serpent seed, they became animalistic. And being able to use their senses over instinct, they became literally sex mongers. And that's exactly where the world stood. Just be honest. You look at history, <clears throat> men and women, always you'll see men and women, they're filthiest under God's high heaven. And the sexual question is always there. <clears throat> see, God predestinated a people who would feed on the word and by the feeding on the word be transformed to the image of Christ. That's exactly why Brother Brown has said the, the, the evidence of the baptism with the Holy Ghost was to receive the word for the hour. <clears throat> to receive an understanding, a revelation of the word of Almighty God. Now listen. Now, we looked at this. So here, we are transforming in physical form. There, we would not have needed it. See? <clears throat> but we are eternal souls. Why? Not that the soul in itself is eternal, but there's a germ in it because souls get destroyed. So some souls don't have that germ in them. They're not a God. We as eternal souls, seed form sons of God, produce flesh bodies instead of word bodies and now feed on the word to be conformed to, the, to Christ. Now let's go and understand a little bit about this. <clears throat> now, to understand this is not existentialism, by John Sartre, but it is the fact we were born to suffer, but suffering is not an end in itself. It is a character reference. <clears throat> Let's go to Rome, Hebrews 12. Now, this is where we're going to look, <clears throat> this is where we're going to quit this morning as soon as I'm finished with this thought. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, that's the heroes of faith, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which thus so easily beset us. That's unbelief. And let us run with patience the race set before us. Gear yourself down. Who ever heard of a person being patient in a race? <clears throat> You've got to be a fruitcake to believe that. <clears throat> it's telling you something. This life is so short. Don't ruin it by impatience. Stretch it out. Get to savor it. Know it's a good life. And here's how you savor it with patience. This quick little life. A little fleeting cloud. The grass that he is and thrown in the oven tomorrow. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. <clears throat> now just keep that in mind. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. He said, I am the Son of God. God is my Father as he's nobody else's Father. <clears throat> I am that Son of Man. <clears throat> I am the Messiah. And they said, you are a no good, illegitimate born son of a Roman soldier by a prostitute. Shut up. No matter what he said and did, everybody contradicted it. He said, why are you stoning me? Tell me what good work that you're stoning me. Oh, they said, we don't stone you for good work. In fact, if you want to stick around and raise the dead and feed us on loaves and fishes and get us ready to knock the Roman army for a loop, <clears throat> that's wonderful. But don't tell me you're a son of God because we're a, and we ought to know one. I'm going to tell you something. Anybody that believes that he's the son of God in these days and takes that stand that I and my father are one, he becomes absolutely anathema to anybody, <clears throat> anybody else. 
And that's why you and I are going to get hit on the head because we literally believe that to be an absolute picture as George J. Lacey, head of the FBI, said it is of a supernatural being over the head of William Brandon. <clears throat> that a pillar of fire actually talked to him and in him and brought us the word of God. We say, you guys are the crazy. Well, I'm, I'm, thank you for being super crazy. The rest are just crazy. You have not yet resisted unto sin striving against, or unto blood striving against him. Jesus sweat great drops of blood. <clears throat> have you forgotten the exhortation which speak not children? My, dis, my children, despise not the training of the Lord, nor faint when thou art re rebuked. In other words, corrected. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects <clears throat> and brings pressure upon every son that he receives so that son will go in the right line. Now, if you endure correcting, God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is he of whom the father does not correct? Now, if you deny correction, it proves you're illegitimate. You're not sons. He said, furthermore, your own nature tells you, <clears throat> as you corrected your children, it is only too true that God should correct you because he's dealing in eternal verities while you are simply dealing with the impatience with your children, hoping they'll do something better than you ever did. And God's trying to bring us up to his standards. <clears throat> All right. Now, we feed on the word to be conformed to the image of Christ and take our inspiration from him because we do not have the inspiration of John 17 and 5, but we believe it. <clears throat> now, remember, here's Jesus. Now, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. He remembered it because he went through it. We were in it, but don't remember it. <clears throat> See? Now keep that in mind. <clears throat> okay? We read John 17 and 5. Now, and now, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory that I had with thee before the world began. Now, let's go back to Hebrews 1. <clears throat> now, you stay with me here because this is important to you. It's important to me. Watch what, what Paul said about Jesus, who being the outraying of his glory, the expression of his substance. Now, what if you and I had been able to do that? <clears throat> we could not be the outraying and the substance. Jesus was. Now, before there was a speck of stardust, before the foundation of this world, we understand thereby that if anything came forth from God, any form, the substance would have to be spirit. Because that which is born of spirit is spirit. Right? <clears throat> that which is born of apples is apples. Dogs, dogs, pigs, pigs. Humans, humans. God, spirits. So therefore, Jesus had that peculiar, particular body that you and I could not have because God, as it were, simply dipped within himself and said, here, and he plunked it in another form. Right? We bypassed it. And he said, I want that glory. You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> okay. Let's go to John 17. And 22. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. <clears throat> that they may be one even as we are one. <clears throat> Other words, the promise of that very thing that they missed, that Jesus had. Okay? <clears throat> okay, with that, let's just take a little picture here of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 and 7. For a man indeed not ought to cover his head for as much as he is the, is the image and glory of God. 
but the woman is the glory of the man. Because the woman came entirely from the man, but notice how the man came. <clears throat> now, he is not the glory and did not have the glory. Adam did not have what Jesus had. He had the full potential for his own status. That's right. He was made for it. <clears throat> the scripture distinctly said, let us make man in our image. And after the image of God created he, Adam, and gave them dominion. And that dominion in the form of a spirit person could absolutely contact and control all nature. What would Adam have done had he had the theophonic form? He would have been literally God in his own rights that God had transferred to him. Didn't have to have it. <clears throat> We're coming back to it. Okay. Let's go to Romans, the third chapter. And notice in verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As Brother Branham correctly said, that the image of God in Adam was broken and lost when the man sinned. <clears throat> the sin condition that man fell into broke that image, which image is going to be restored, and that very, very shortly. Notice in Romans, the ninth chapter, the 23rd verse, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. <clears throat> now we find the promise here of the restoration of glory. Now, Remember, the word glory comes from the original Greek meaning an assessment. <clears throat> you say, oh, look at the glorious sunset. It means in your eyes you have compared all the sunsets you have ever seen and you say that there's nothing will touch that sunset. I've seen them all. <clears throat> you say this is the most glorious experience I have entered into. Of all your experiences, this eclipses them all. Then when you are speaking of the glory of God, you are saying the same thing. This is my assessment. That's why Christ is the glory of God. And Christ is the mystery of God revealed. And if we could ever get the real understanding and insight that the prophet tried to bring us, what a people we would be. As he says, he was living up here in that realm. Now that he's gone, you and I can attain to that realm. That's it. You, you, you say, how is that? That's exactly what Jesus said. He said, you cannot be in my realm at this time. But when I am gone, you can be in that realm. <clears throat> See? Why? Because I tell you, every prophet, bar none, had a word given to him which was not to him and for him, but it was for others. Others got it. You show me one thing Jesus did that he retained. He gave it all to everybody else. And thereby retained it because now it's multiplied <clears throat> out there for the glory of God. See, the, the great assessment. Now, let's look at some scriptures on this great assessment that you, you and I might know. This tremendous glory that lies ahead. <clears throat> in this great theophonic form that the dead get when they get out of here. That the soul picks up. That was his in the first place. And let me tell you something. The soul, therefore, will always be an orphan to any form until it gets its own form. Isn't it? <clears throat> you think a dog could be happy with suddenly inheriting a human intelligence? You think you could be happy if you could inherit suddenly if with a human intelligence <clears throat> find yourself in, in, in some kind of another form? No, you're foreign to it. That's why there's so many, <clears throat> these, these fellows that let their imaginations go, they, they have so many funny ideas for movies. People get locked up in the wrong form. That's why idolaters, <clears throat> they believe a spirit can go into an image. It becomes a literal God. 
They're crazy. There's no, there's no such thing as, as anybody being happy in a form that doesn't belong to him. That's why a dog can always wag his tail and be happy. If he wants to be. <coughs> he's with his own master. They don't understand. We cannot be happy in this form. That is truly happy because no matter what, there is a longing for people to penetrate those things which are veiled or hidden. <coughs> okay. Let's get into 2 Corinthians here, the fourth chapter. Let's look at this. But we have this treasure, this soul, this gene from God in earthen vessels. Vessels that sin, that have indecision, that can't make correct judgments, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. <clears throat> now there's something tremendously excellent coming up that will be bestowed in spite of the vessel of clay and because of the treasure in the vessel, which is the soul, with the gene of God. Right? That's right. <clears throat> Just follow the thinking. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. <clears throat> Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. All was bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, and the life all, that the life also Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Now that's wonderful. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it's written, I believed and therefore have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. <clears throat> now notice Paul says now, he said, I've got a revelation here. According to vindication, I'm going to pass it on. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us with you. He said, you're going to be there with me. Brother Branham saw us with, with, with him. Paul saw his group with him. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace through the thanksgiving of many may redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. What inward man? Spirit? No. The life in the soul <clears throat> is renewed. In other words, it took a mighty shock and a mighty step down when it came here. Now he's moving back. Moving back while he is in this form. In this triunity. Now watch. For our light affliction. And listen, they were dying. Put to the sword. Frozen. Women with children. Ready to give birth. Ripped up and fed to hogs. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Can you believe then? <clears throat> that what we are looking at, though we cannot see it, and have to take this by faith for our living inspiration, for had we known it like Jesus, we'd have sweat blood and cared less. It wouldn't have been a decision. What do you got next, devil? What do you got next? You're looking at a son of God. Now it says this. Now let's understand. It says right here, and let's read it again. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us. The treasure in earthen vessel, the life within the soul, is now looking <clears throat> not at what it missed, but what is beyond what it missed. Now you can't, listen, let's understand this. How can I preach it? How can you believe it? If God doesn't quicken it, forget it. Yeah. Somebody's going to have it, though. If not you and me, somebody will get this. I don't care anybody says. In every single age, there are people, and especially this age, you're going to get this. <clears throat> A far more exceeding, exceeding and eternal way to glory. Now remember, 
Brother Branham used the word eternal concerning that body we go to, and the scripture says it's eternal, which means it didn't have a beginning and an end, so therefore it is formed of the substance of God. I don't care what anybody says. This desk is not substance of God, and that's not substance of God. That's created, but there is a literal substance because Jesus was the outraying of it. <clears throat> you and I missed it. <clears throat> now there's something beyond just going to that form. Well, you know what it is as well as I do. New Jerusalem reigning and ruling, but let's watch it. Now watch, and here's the secret. While we look not at the things which are seen. Now you may see things in me you don't like. I see things in you I don't like. Proves we're, we belong to one cub. <clears throat> one club. Not the exonerators, but the accusers. Well, then we also excuse each other. So we belong to the accusers, exonerators club. Half devil and half God. All messed up. One half makes one whole. None of it. Half and half. Now look at it. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us. What's it doing? <clears throat> a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. That's an assessment. <clears throat> In other words, this assessment is above everything that a man could desire for. And if he's a son of God, he won't desire to be God. That's the devil. He'll desire what God wants for him. And there's no way, even us knowing, that this theophonic form was so wonderful, which it is, what's coming will eclipse it. In other words, if that which was, we left aside to gain a greater glory for God being down here, what would it be if this is the glory of God here? See, this level. And it comes here. What will it be when it gets here and reverses? Nobody knows. Just got to believe it. For I hath not seen nor heard. There's no way, brother, sister, that you can tell. <clears throat> it's just like a beautiful bush, beautiful plant. <clears throat> and it's got fantastic flowers on top. But they say, hey, I got news for you. Pull up the plant and dig the tubers. Say, man, I never taste anything like this. On the other hand, take some tubers. And here they are. Say, wait, well, man, what is that? That's the body, the seed. In there is the life, the temporary carrier of the most beautiful plant you've ever seen. Plant the thing, water it, let the sunshine hit it. The flower, you say, my God, how, except for God. That's right. I couldn't believe such a thing existed. But notice what I'm showing you. There has to come from the seed, and it goes both ways. This came down. Let it catch up. You can see why Brother Branham, when he saw that group of people, and he amongst them said, don't, don't, don't. He just pleaded with a man, almost with a sickening force. Don't, don't miss it as though it was our choice. I think he was saying, don't, don't miss the revelation I'm trying to give you. It staggers you. You know why? Look, at, we've got no memory of it. There's nothing here. It's a faith proposition, as with Paul, by vindication. If you can accept the vindication principle, brother, sister, you and I can accept anything. The trouble is, we really can't. Well, not really can't, we just aren't. Why do you think Brother Branham put 80% of his time on vindication? Come on! Because people just don't go for it. Vindication is what? Spaghetti and marinara. Vindication's a loaf of bread and a pound of butter. 
Vindication is the hog wallow. You're looking at something greater where God puts himself on the spot. You know, we're not near Solomon up because see what I'm saying here. <clears throat> Look, but don't be discouraged because it'll catch up with us. Before you get the water, you got to have the conduit. The seed without the rain and the sun will lie there. But Brother Branham's categorically stated, he said, listen, the properly fertilized soil with the properly germatized seed with the sun and the rain will bring forth. And he said, I, the Lord, have planted it and watered it and will see that no man plucks it out of my hand. He took scriptures and wrote them together like Paul did. Nobody but a prophet can do that, so forget it. <clears throat> now here you are. I read 7 to 18. Now listen. This martyr's age, now watch now. This martyr's age understood this. The martyr age was the calf age. Age number one knew this. <clears throat> but it was the revealed word of God going forth like a lion. But in the next age, it was the head of a calf, the symbol of death and crucifixion. And they were so happy to die. They couldn't wait to die because they knew they were going to get there. And they fulfilled their role. And so from that seed up here that was down here, they went back and they're going higher. <clears throat> Every age is different. We have the age of revelation, the eagle. <clears throat> so therefore, we cannot wait for revelation. Everything is revelation. Though we school ourselves in patience, knowing we cannot force God to reveal anything to us. The screen does not go to the projector or the projectionist and say, now, I'm going to run here, I'm going to run there. The screen stands still and the hand of the projectionist focuses in the light. And the screen that stands still is the screen that gets the full picture. And that's what's wrong with people. Run, run, run. Look here. Turn back this way. You get nowhere in these services. Let me tell you, flatten anybody hearing my voice on tapes, and there's hundreds if not thousands out there. I'll tell you, flat, you will get nowhere, nowhere, nowhere. <coughs> Till you learn to just settle down and let the light focus in. <coughs> you wonder why people aren't getting healed. That's all there is to it. <clears throat> why our lives aren't where they should be. That's all there is to it. Because there's a light to walk in. And which tells us flat, you don't walk unless there is light because the Bible tells us men do not walk where there is no light, a Christian. And the light, thy word is a light to my path, a lamp unto my feet. <clears throat> We're looking at the revelation today in contradistinction. Let me go to 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, beginning at verse 7. But if the ministration of death written in graven and stones was glorious, so the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of spirit be even uncomparably glorious? <clears throat> the ministration of God then bringing to our attention, now listen closely, bringing to our attention what Brother Branham said, the revelation under the seventh seal, the seven thunders, bringing those mysteries which were not known from the foundation of the world, but are known now. <clears throat> what does it mean? It means receiving a revelation as I am trying to preach from Brother Branham's message, if I understand correctly in telling you. And you and I receiving this prehistoric, this pre-foundation revelation puts us in a place of incomparable life before God. I've preached this for years. Ever since I came away from the organization, I have preached what I'm preaching. If the Word doesn't do it, if God doesn't do it, it won't be done. And there's only one thing worthwhile, and that's the listening of the Word. For the ministration of condemnation or judgment would be glory. Much more doth the ministry of righteousness exceed in glory. Man able to go to the tree of life. Man knowing the word of God and abiding by it. Man having a revelation, not like Cain who was that wicked one. And why did he want to kill his brother and did kill his brother? Because he positively had a wrong revelation. 
and the revelation was, let's get rid of this bum Abel, then I'm the only guy left with the revelation, and my revelation, then will take it. That's why the Catholic Church killed everybody, and the Protestants are doing the same thing now. Let's kill the guys. That's why they want to kill you and me and Will, if they get a chance. <clears throat> let's get rid of those birds. <clears throat> get rid of the revelation, that'll take care of it. You know what I'm talking about. Come on, you've got to be plumb dead, or my God knows, I don't know. Now, for even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. <clears throat> what about the glory of Catholicism? It's gone with Luther. Luther's gone with Wesley. Wesley with Pentecost. And Pentecost has no glory now. Who's got glory? There's only one people got glory, and those are the ones that come under the ministry of Elijah. <clears throat> and what's it going to do? Brother Branham said, a glory that does not fade away. If it doesn't fade away, what happens? Does it stand still? No, it gets greater and greater because the light shines more and more to the perfect day. Now listen, seeing then we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses would put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end that was abolished. <clears throat> now listen, the prophet didn't, the William Branham didn't have a veil over his face. Let's get it. Moses had to put one. So William Branham's message will not die. It'll fulfill its divine order. Moses could only get them to the promised land. And they died like flies before they got there. And when they got to the promised land, they still died. These people will never die. <clears throat> but their minds were blinded, for until this day remained at the same veil and taken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Coming into view, same as today. But even unto this day when Moses read, the veil's upon the heart. Nevertheless, when there shall be, it shall turn to the Lord. What is that? The mind will turn to the Lord. The mind will deliberately say, hey, I've got to look at this thing. That's what Moses did. He used his mind. He said, what, what's with this bush anyway? What is with this thing anyway? Good curiosity doesn't hurt you as long as it's godly. <clears throat> now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. No more prison houses. But we all with open face beholding as a glass the glory of the Lord. Our change in the same image from glory to glory it is by the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, he tells you flat, when you get rid of every preconceived idea concerning the Word of God, and you can take this word plumb out flat the way they had to take it in the day of Paul, you will be in, in process of the change. <clears throat> and what's it go from? It goes all the way to complete glorification just like Jesus Christ in spite of missing the theophonic form. Then think of what Jesus did for us. <clears throat> Took us all the way there. So we are living today in a message which discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart, cutting away every veil, and takes us absolutely back to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. <clears throat> for we are not come to Mount Zion. No, sir, we aren't. We're come to, I mean, to Mount Sinai. We're come to Mount Zion. Right up to this point, <clears throat> we are now on the very steps of the new Jerusalem waiting for the final curtain of time to be pulled aside, <clears throat> which will be 24 hours and a few minutes from now, or seconds, to form a part of the General Assembly of the Church of the Firstborn, all of whose names written in heaven, standing before God the Judge of all, just like we saw the picture, to the Word, <clears throat> right back to Abel, the, re the original revelation. And verse 25, See that you receive not, refuse not him that speaketh. <clears throat> Because this word is going to shake everything down. And only the things of God will remain. Because at this point, our God's a consuming fire. <clears throat> I had to skip that. First Peter, Second Peter, the first chapter, verse 15. He's going to tell them about the, about mount, about the mount, mount of uh, <clears throat> transfiguration. And he said here, in verse 17, We receive from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him, the excellent glory, this is my beloved son whom I well please. Now he said, we received honor there. We received glory there. <clears throat> we saw the estimation of God toward us. And we say God's own estimation of himself at that time. <clears throat> we stood there and we knew what we were into. Now he said, if that was great, I want to tell you something. He said, there's a, a word of prophecy made sure at the end time. What time is that? When the light shines in a dark place, the last seventh church age, until the day dawn, day dawn, and the day star rise in your hearts. 
when prophecy will come forth. <clears throat> He's speaking of that in this very hour here. This is the glory we are into at this very moment, and this glory cannot fade. And we're going to go to Romans, the 8th chapter. And I'm skipping a bit here, but I'll let you fill these in because you can do it yourself. Romans 8 and 8, 18, For I reckon the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared to with the glory that shall be revealed in us. <clears throat> not simply a glory that we missed and we pick up, <clears throat> but a glory far beyond it from the seed that went both ways, from the God that went both ways, up and down. That which came down goes back to where it was and far beyond it. You believe that? Come on. Leave your finger there. <clears throat> Let's go to Colossians. Verse 15, first chapter. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created, when in heaven and earth, and things visible, and stones, and so on. Principal dominions. He's being the firstborn from the dead, <clears throat> that he might have the preeminence in all things. It pleased God <clears throat> to do this for him. Why? For the very reason that Jesus Christ died and God raised him. Let's go to Ephesians and see it. <clears throat> First chapter, verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him the dead and set him his honor and hand him in face, the fireball, principal and power, and them things to come. Put all things under his feet. <clears throat> Did he have that to begin with? No. <clears throat> is he getting it now? Yes. And so are we. Then, brother, sister, the incomparable glory we're looking at of all the ages is right here, a picture taken of it. You can say, Brother Vale, I don't see that. That's fine. You don't see anything. I see it. <clears throat> I see it because I'm looking at it. I hear what the prophet said. A vindicated man. Then I believe what he said rather than what I think I see. Now, there's your starting place, and that's where you're going. Just go back in your mind the time that Brother Zabel read, uh, Brother Branham read Tony Zabel, The Riot Act. Oh, he read him The Riot Act in a nice way because he did not believe Brother Branham. And he was there when it happened, as far as I know. I may have a lot of things that are hard for me to understand. <clears throat> and I'll say the truth, hard to believe. But I'll never forget the day I sat with Brother Branham right behind him with that cord wrapped three times around him. And my eyes are looking at you right now. And you're not winking. And I never winked before my eyes. That cord was no longer three times around, but right by his feet. Say, Brother Vail, you're a bit of a fool. Absolutely, I am too. What are you? Amen. What smarts have you got? <clears throat> what can you prove and what can you show? You believe a stupid camera? I sure do. More than a stupid person. <coughs> and so does a judge too. The true judge that knows the law doesn't go by man's testimony. If the testimony is contrary to an actual photograph. But what if the actual photograph was there with the actual testimony? <clears throat> now you're getting somewhere. Liz, I'm reading the close. Romans 8, 18. Here's why we came down here in this body. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Why the prophet said we bypassed it. We bypassed that great glory that we'd like to have and said, well, my God, I hate sin. I wish I wasn't a sinner. How many times you look back and you're sorry you hurt somebody's feelings? I look back every single day. You made a blooper. Oh, if I were in that form, you'd have missed what God wanted for you. Because there's a greater glory. Listen, for I reckon the sufferings this present time are not worthy to be prepared with the glory which shall be revealed. Not the glory Jesus talked about, but a greater glory. For the earnest expectation of creature, <coughs> of creation, waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For creation was not made subject to vanity willingly, 
but by reason of God who subjected the same in hope. Because the creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of children of God, into the, unto the liberty of the glory. In other words, the final assessment of man, what God can and do, will do, will be reflected all out there. Little old hybrid there looks pretty nice. Kind of sleazy alongside of some of the more pompous and beautiful ones. That'll look pretty sleazy, what's coming up in the future. <clears throat> oh, yeah, we, we ray ourselves and find clothes. But not one of us is arrayed like the lily of the field that God just put a seed and let it come up. What will the raiment be like then? I don't know. What will it be like there? You know, <clears throat> Brother Brandon made a comparison. I forget exactly what it was. But something like the fact, if a dog could be suddenly transformed to a human being, what a tremendous transformation, what a glory that would be. That doesn't even explain the glory that lies ahead at this particular time. For we know the whole creation groans and travails in pain until now. And not only it, but ourselves also, which have the first fruit of the Spirit. <clears throat> See? <clears throat> Giving us a compensation for what we missed in the theophonic form. Even ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the placing, the redemption. And that's not all there is to it. Picking up the theophonic form, that's not all there is to it. Going on to the infinite God and what lies in Him is ours. And before they call the answers, <clears throat> before anybody could even think of a glory, and think of something. Think of a desire. It just sweeps in from God. So man never ceases to wonder. That's why we're here. Yeah. Some people catch the vision, others never do. Paul knew that was possible. A man could preach it and himself be disapproved. I can stand here and plant a seed this morning and miss it a million miles. You can sit here this morning and miss it a million miles because this is for the elect. And I'm sorry, I've got to preach the truth all the way. This is not meant for everybody. Salvation is not for everybody. New Jerusalem is not for everybody. Healing is not for everybody. We preach it as though it were because we don't know who is seed. That's a good thing. The Bible warns us never try to figure it out. For the stand, foundation of God standeth sure. And this seed, the Lord knoweth them which are his, and not somebody else. But if you count yourself seed this morning, brother, sister, and I trust we all do, because we all ought to. <clears throat> because we're here for a certain word, not something else. You'd be if you listen, if you wanted to pepper your message, and you wanted more hip or all, and you wanted more this and that, you would not be here this morning. I can tell you that because you're not going to get it here. I've been all through it. I've seen more healings you can shake a stick at. I've seen all the rest of it. And I'm going to stay with this because it alone is vindicated as I understand vindication. And because of this, there's something there, brother, sister, a deep calling to deep that this little spark in here just knows something in there, but how deep it cannot know until it is there and the deep begins flowing under the conditions of the seed no longer having come down, but the seed having gone back and now going up. And it's infinite. Let's rise and be dismissed. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we can understand a little of how Paul could be so completely imbued. Moses could be imbued. The men, Lord, that you sent upon this earth as leaders are imbued, as Brother Branham was imbued. All just as it were and are a part of Jesus Christ who is the great imbuement of God. And Lord, we're stuck here this morning with a, not stuck, Lord, really, but here we are attached, hopefully, believing, to a word that is not sterile, a word at this time that is mechanical, forming a conduit. For your spirit, O oh God, to quicken to us and then 
be fulfilled in us. And it's all of God. Knowing you set before us one trial and one testing, one temptation, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not look upon that any longer, but came down to take another form. And in that mind, rise above everything and bring us with him to this place, Lord, where we're going and far beyond to the fullness of God as we could not possibly know it now, but will one day know more and more. Father, help us to fight that battle of Armageddon because we know we were set here for it, Lord. And as Paul said to make your calling and election, sure, I would trust my God that that I and my household and every single person in his or her household will enter into that divine proposition, Lord, of believing the revelation and moving out somehow in their battle of Armageddon to believe you in every word and clog every channel of the mind with that word, fill it to such an extent nothing can come by it knowing then that the Word will take form in us, and that same Word will take us right to the eternal things of Yourself, Lord, and the greater glory, the glory that excelleth, the excellent glory. We've seen a portion today, Father. We know it's true by the prophet's message. I've been fortunate, Lord, to be right around it so much. That I have an obligation, Lord, above others to declare it. I realize that, Lord, but others can catch the glow and be just as fervent by revelation even as Paul was because he wasn't around Jesus. And then all together, Lord, in our fervency, we can believe and form a faith, Lord, that though it doesn't raise the dead, it sure heals the sick and brings the goodness and glory of God amongst us. Father, we pray for every single one here that none miss your eternal life and that which lies ahead and none of us esteem anybody except in the grace and mercy of our God in honor preferring each other walking softly walking before you humbly walking in the light with the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us this is what we want Lord this is what we thank you for now unto the King eternal immortal and visible the only wise God be all power in honor and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen Take the name of Jesus with you.